Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of OK Coin Live today with our favorite, <laughs> Mr. Michael Wagner. Michael! What's what up, up, guys? <laughs> We're all alive. We're back. We're making our way through this uh, this fantastic market. But uh, awesome to be here, guys. Good to chat with you again. It's been a while. So Michael is the CEO of Star Atlas. And uh, we listed Star Atlas well over a year ago now. And we've been big fans. I know you guys have, you know, in this, in this world of, of games, everyone is looking to, you know, there was a big narrative of the metaverse and games. And I think people don't realize that it takes about four to five years, three to four years to build a AAA Unreal Engine 5 game. And it's not like you snap your fingers and you, you know, actually there's actually infinity, obviously a very basic game. Uh, so that iteration is coming quickly, but it takes a while to build really good games. And so I remember the first time we had you on, you showed us some uh, scenes from behind the scenes, scenes from behind the scenes definitely should be a thing. And uh, they were pretty spectacular. Harrison, I mean, were you, I was impressed. Were you impressed? Yeah, I wanted to play the game immediately. Um, I've been just waiting in the wings here for over a year now. Probably waiting. we're getting closer though, right, Michael? Well, the time has come. We're here. But I mean, just on that point though, you know, this the whole idea of, uh, you know, three, five, seven year development cycle. Um, that that would be aggressive in modern era AAA game development, um, like Starfield, uh, which is a Bethesda game. It looks beautiful, by the way. It's a you know kind of a space exploration game, space themed game as well. They've been in development for ten years, right? Star Citizen has been in development for ten or twelve years. Uh, Cyberpunk was like seven or eight years of development, and it still came out and it had a bunch of bugs, and they were kind of rushed to release. So. Um, Ultimately for us, though, at, at Automata, the studio behind Star Atlas, um, the idea is that, that the product's never really finished anyway. Uh, this is like intended to be perpetual, and, and that's driven by this philosophy of having decentralized governance, of having the DAO, of having a, a financial architecture and mechanism that collects taxation through this digital economy, through this universe, uh, that can then go f like be utilized, perpetuate the development in the future, whether that's by our team or by someone else. Now, we're here for the long term, right? We'll be building this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, we're, we're all in on this. But um, the idea is that somebody will pick up the baton at some point in the future and continue the development and continue the evolution, create you know, the next you know, version of this. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. It's, uh, it's, it's awesome in a world of uh, instant gratification. And I want my returns now i want my games now you guys are completely yeah. bucking the trend yeah. um some might call you iconoclast i don't know if you're you're ready Ooh. to take that title on but i think it fits well here i don't know if my ego can handle that at this point but uh <laughs> but i appreciate it all the same i it, yeah i mean like ours is uh you know what we attempt to do is provide sufficient um content to consume iteratively so that there's at least something to enjoy right we're not going we, we what we don't do is take that traditional triple a game development approach of saying we're going to build in isolation behind uh closed curtains and deliver you a product when it's fully polished and refined and complete from a gameplay loop perspective it's hey we're going to build a little segment of this we're going to make it as fun as possible uh we're going to optimize for quality of graphical fidelity storytelling of of uh you know gfx the stuff that makes a triple A game triple A will optimize for all of those things. And we'll give you a taste. Um, and then we'll continue building in the background and we'll give you the next taste and we'll give you the next taste. So fortunately for us, what we have been able to do now is roll out that first version of our unreal engine client. Uh, we launched that through Epic game store on September 29th. So 12 days ago. Now we've had some 5,000 downloads on Epic game store. And what's impressive about that is uh, this is actually a completely closed pre alpha um, access. So the only way you can download is um, by being provided with a game access key. Um, and I can get into kind of the mechanics of how that works, but essentially anybody who's been part of our ecosystem through their player profile uh, on play.staratlas.com, they'll have access to those game keys. So it's it's pretty amazing though. We got 5,000 people to download in, in 12 days. Um, and, and I'll also caveat that and say, we don't have 
full uh, hardware wallet ledger support integrated just yet, although it's rolling out this week. And the majority of our users are actually using cold storage, um, which is something that we advocate for. So there's kind of a lot to unpack there. But point is, big release, Epic Game Store, um, uh, and it, it feels like a major win and a major milestone for us. Yeah, that's awesome. Alex, did you have a, I have a question if you don't. Yeah, this is, I mean, look, I, I'm super excited. Actually, b before we, uh, we fully jump into this, can you just help us from a gameplay? I, I have two questions, but from a gameplay perspective, what's changed? The last time we talked to you, we just launched the asset allocation module where, you know, you would just choose. It was literally the first experience with, uh, with Star Atlas. So what's changed between then and now and what's left to build? And then I have a second one. Can I have a second one? Can I please ask a second one after? You, Alex, you can have as many questions as you want, man. Yes. I'm here for you. <laughs> uh, here we go. Here we go. I'm ready to go. I'm loosening up. It, it might help to uh, contextualize this, though, with a um, kind of a big framework because I mentioned this hardware wallet thing. So maybe let me just take an even further step back and say at Automata, we, we build across really three core categories or verticals within our business. And you know, one of those is gaming. One of those is infrastructure and architecture. And then the third is our marketplace product, uh, which was custom built from the ground up uh, and delivers a phenomenal experience on Solana. Uh, this marketplace program is an on-chain program built on Solana. From the gaming perspective, uh, there's also three subcategories. So there's the Unreal Engine client. This is the fully immersive cinematic quality world. Um, there's a web client, and we made a decision this year to enhance that experience beyond what we originally proposed, which was a text-based, uh, interactive, online like web gaming product into a full, fully immersive 3D WebGL-based uh, uh, client that is built in Play Canvas. So you, you've got a world that's fully immersive in Unreal Engine. That's a downloadable game client. You have one you can load in your browser. And then we've kicked off a mobile division this year. Nothing yet revealed on that, but uh, more of a companion app style mobile application that's in development as well. Before getting into the gaming stuff, I just want to mention that one of the big releases that we launched this year, and this was also on September 29th, was a software development kit that we call Foundation SDK or the F kit. Um, and what we accomplished with that was developing the first ever native Solana integration directly into Unreal Engine. So no longer do you need to say Alt-Tab or have a web browser pop up while you're playing the game to confirm a transaction. Every transaction is processed directly through the game client itself. And we've open sourced that. So now any studio in the world that wants to build, wants to build on Solana um, and wants to integrate blockchain into their game is able to do so. And we see massive potential in having other game studios build products that in some way integrate with our universe as well. Like this is the metaverse, right? So that's kind of the, the real long-term future vision, interoperable game environments. So, and also, um, Michael, there, I just want to interject for a second. That also reduces the, uh, the user experience with blockchain as well. Is that, is that true to say? I would say it simplifies it, um, in, in many ways. Now, you know, I, it, it has been a while since we've spoken, I, I, you know, depending on the audience, I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but. Our philosophy is really to build a lot of the game logic directly on Solana as well. So we're, we're not just integrating NFTs. We're not just integrating cryptographic assets as part of the economy, but we actually use uh, Solana essentially as the game server to the fullest extent possible. So crafting of resources or refueling your ship or you know even in the web client movement, like moving from point A to point B, these are all... Uh, transactions that take place on blockchain. So you do want a seamless experience. You want that to be smooth. You don't want it to be inconvenient to have to confirm a transaction as you're taking actions within the game. And we actually have things in the works that are going to simplify that even greater. So a user will never necessarily know that they're confirming a transaction while they're in the midst of a gameplay session, um, although their assets can remain secure on a, on a hardware device. But the other part of that for us was that we were able to, like on this SDK, we built a wallet. So we built the Star Atlas wallet that lives in Unreal Engine. And that means that you can either import uh, a seed phrase, a mnemonic, you can create a wallet, or you can connect your ledger device directly to that, and it views all of your assets. And again, you play with those. 
So <clears throat> I can get back to your question, Alex, <laughs> if, if you want. I like to take us on these long meandering uh, journeys no, no. Through, the, through development. <laughs> These listen. These are these are great because there's like as you're pulling, as you're going down. There's a couple of threads I want to pull. Solana, for example, just you know to call it elephant in the room and scalability and you know whether you can, how do you rely on the L1 that you know has had some problems, right? You want to make sure that the game isn't stopped mid game and reset, so to speak. But but just help us, you know. Maybe maybe let me just kind of uh, before we go into the technicals, just from from a high level vision so now we have a working pre-alpha right then we'll have an alpha and then you you kind of roll it out and then you're always adding to the game i love the fact that you guys are outsourcing the the sdk and making that open source i mean that that's huge and like you said that is the vision of the metaverse so i've interop across studios and across games uh just help us just maybe in like in you know we were an asset allocation now we are full gameplay but for for our audience who doesn't know Star Atlas, so imagine, you know, it's it's a combination of a AAA game, so beautifully beautifully done. I, I maybe this is stupid, but I I always uh, equate it to like an Avatar type graphics, very rich, beautiful graphics. First person shooter plus strategy, plus you're flying around this incredible universe from planet to planet, rock to rock, you know. Um, looking for various things we'll, well we won't spoil everything but uh uh so there there is a strategy component to it there's a resource allocation component to it there's a gameplay component to it there's an artistry component to it how do you fit all that in and you know where are you now on the journey to actually building out a universe right because the universe has to be self-sustained people have to be able to fly from planet to planet spend hours there if not days and then do the thing and interact with that world there's a lot of degrees of freedom here right there's a lot of unknown unknowns of how humans will interact with each other yeah um i mean th th there is a lot to it so uh, i guess uh, also to start here the 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 big picture vision is grand strategy space exploration massively multiplayer world so it's an open world concept you know virtually infinite universe uh being built in and again unreal engine using unreal engine 5 uh all of the assets in the game are nfts so whether that we're talking land or your character or your ship and the components and crew members within that buildings and structures habitats that you own on space stations space stations themselves these are all effectively nfts that can be owned by individuals almost any observable item in the universe can be owned by a player um now there's many different ways that you can engage in Star Atlas, or at least um, as we've proposed and laid out in our in our um, game design doc and white paper. Uh, but you know, the first of those is hop in a spaceship and go explore the stars. Um, and and there's something like 20 or t t actually maybe like 28 career paths that you can take. So that could be a data runner, right? You're literally just navigating the stars. You're exploring for new territory. Based on your findings, you collect these data packages. You can turn around and sell that to someone else. This allows you to um, expand the universe itself. You can be a bounty hunter. Uh, you can be uh, a salvage, uh, a salvager, a mining ship, a freighter, right? These are all things that facilitate the means of production and movement of supply chains around this universe. Uh, on land, you can operate a mining facility, an extraction facility on the earth, or, or, or rather on the celestial body. Um, and in doing so, you're extracting resources that go into the crafting of new items. So there's this whole crafting loop wherein you're actually able to use blueprints and resources collected and refined to turn those into additional NFTs. You can create a, a, a your own spaceship and turn around and sell a spaceship to somebody else. Um, and then there's plenty of ways that you can participate just through socializing on a on a space station. So there are three different factions: the the mud, the ooster, the oni. The the mud is essentially the remnants of uh, the human species. Uh, the ooster is a sentient android uh, species, and the oni is a consortium of alien races from all over this universe. They've all kind of collected around the cataclysm, uh, which is um, where this hyper dense resource rich uh super valuable mineral set lives and so these three groups are kind of competing over access to that territory that's the store that's the story that's the lore behind it um uh 
and but if you're if you're you know just to say you're a casual player looking to socialize in, through the metaverse lens you don't need to own any of those items you don't need to possess anything you don't need to travel at all you you can spend your entire existence inside star atlas simply living on one of the space stations and interacting with other players or playing mini games there or you know catching a sporting event inside uh inside the space station itself so there's a lot of different ways that you can participate now the first product that we rolled out was um when you're saying asset allocation i, I assume you're referring to like the faction fleet which was um you know really busy last year but um one of the things that we executed on towards the end of the year was uh, this was following the token generation event was the sale of ship NFTs through our galactic asset offering. And um, it was important for us understanding that we had a long timeline ahead of us for, for the full immersive gameplay to provide some immediate utility to those assets. And so we launched what we called faction fleet and faction fleet is very basic. It's uh, the, the narrative behind it is that you're enlisting your ships with your faction. You're essentially loaning them out to your faction to use on your behalf. Um, and what you as the player are responsible for is managing a set of four different resources. And to the extent that there are non-zero balances on all four of those assets, uh, you're earning Atlas in return, which is our in-game currency. Polis is the governance token, Atlas is the in-game currency. So it was a way for players to participate in this play-to-earn economy as early as December of last year. For, so this entire year has been building the Unreal Engine client and also doing a ton of work on, on the web client. Um, and what we've so what we've rolled out today is what we call the showroom. This is the pre-alpha. The showroom is, uh, and, and I don't know if uh, Jacob can pull up maybe some videos or are we able to stream video or, I mean, I could even try to. Let's do it. I think if you share your screen, it'll work. Okay. I don't know what to do okay. I can try to do this on the fly. I mean, I could probably even pull up the game client and just like do a little running around if you guys want to see that. I don't let's know. Do if... it, let's do it. Let's do it. Now, yeah. Listen, as long as you just mentioned one thing, it got me scared. I'm not going to lie. Okay. I'm a little scarred. You said there are 28 career paths? <laughs> something like that, yeah. I just need to know which career path I need to take because last time I played something with a lot of career paths was Oregon Trail. And every single time at the Mississippi <laughs> River, I died of dysentery. So I just need to know how to get across from universe to universe without uh, dying. Uh, unfortunately, there are far more risks in the universe of Star Atlas than dysentery on the... Uh, uh, on the Oregon Trail, but you know I have confidence in you, Alex. <laughs> All right, so I'm I'm it. loading up the showroom right now. Let me see if I can uh, change some settings oh. real quick and make this streamable for everybody. I haven't actually streamed this live, so we're just kind of uh, we're, we're gonna trial by fire here. We're gonna try. I think uh, Jacob just said Zencaster doesn't. We're using Zencaster to to stream. This is gonna be all live. We're not even cutting this. Uh, where uh, he's saying Zencaster doesn't support uh, screen sharing. We have to change to Riverside here. This is uh, this is not good. We need to be able to show some screens. Okay, so we can't we can't stream right now. Is what you're saying? It sounds like we no, cannot. Michael, one idea you could use the reflection in the TV behind you, <laughs> or you could just that, put it on that TV yeah. and change your video. <laughs> it's actually a holographic picture frame, but it, I thought it was a TV when I moved in here as well. But no, it's a it's a holographic picture frame. But uh, uh, it, yeah, let's we'll we'll just point people in the right direction, um, uh, so people can check it out themselves or. Um, yeah, if we can't if we can't stream any of like the YouTube videos, that's okay. It it, it it's fine. the The whole idea behind Showroom is that um, it's it's essentially the remnants of planet Earth, uh, and uh, it's a place where you can go experience any of the ships that you own. So you do have to connect your wallet. Any of the assets that you possess in your wallet will be visible and summonable in the Showroom. But if you don't own the ship, you can't view it. And uh, it gives players a, a couple of things. First, the true sense of ownership, a sense of scale, and a sense of the quality and caliber of the development that we pursue. So the showroom itself is incredibly beautiful. A lot of the ship models are still in 
clay format, so they don't have full textures, they don't have hard surface, they're not animated yet, they don't have the VFX on them, you can't get in the inside of it, you can't fly it around just yet, but of the 60 or so ships that we've launched, you can pull virtually all of those into the engine and you can see what that looks like at scale. And it's it's really incredible. You have some ships that are you know three meters, essentially the size of your character, and then you also have ships that are couple hundred meters long that you can only load outside on the dock and you just see these things side by side and you you'll understand you know uh the true value and the true capabilities of each one of these assets so that's what it is today uh but in the very near future um we're looking at uh, november and i I'll, i'm hesitant around specifying any dates but we're looking in november um probably keep an eye out for solana breakpoint i don't know if you guys will be there but if so we'll see you there um but keep we're an eye coming, for some we're gonna we're, we're gonna be at, at london in 2049 just the week before or after we're just gonna miss you just but, extend uh, the trip extend the trip, extend the trip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, okay, so uh, November we have um, our R2 release, which is a release candidate, the second one. And uh, within this uh, release, it's you'll see far more extensive feature capabilities. So things like a little obstacle course that you can navigate. Um, very likely that we have character selection in there. And by the way, the obstacle course uh, will have potentially two ships, at least one for sure, potentially two ships that are fully animated and prepared for uh, prepared for flight. And uh, that obstacle course will have, uh, will keep track of scores. So people will be, be able to compete for the high score on this obstacle course. Uh, and what we'll continue to do is expand in this showroom uh, module for the time being, because we use this internally. We use this internally as a uh, a test bed for a lot of the technologies that are in development by us. So our asset production pipelines and content production pipelines, we use this uh, internally and we've released that to the world so people can kind of get exposure to that same functionality. As we progress, you get access to the new features. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, that's great transparency. I think um, most people in crypto would, will appreciate any founding team wanting to share more information rather than less. Um, and that actually, I know that you had something else maybe you wanted to finish, but I, I did want to transition a bit to maybe sure. a little bit more of a macro discussion around gaming. Um, sure. And so like one of the ways I think about like whether or not a game will be sustainable in, in terms of crypto, um, there has to be four factors. So one is, is it fun? Two, will it last generations? I think Star Atlas for both of those, it, it's definitely going to hit those. Um the other one that I'm curious about, and I think people listening will be curious about, is whether or not it's accessible to all. Um, that's like mainly like a what's the cost to play question. Um, and I know, so I'd, I'd like to, I guess, hear your thoughts on that. And then lastly, um, whether or not it's a Ponzi scheme. And I, you, in your guys' announcements, uh, recent announcements, I know you've made some changes to token economics and through the, the locking function, uh, a few other things. But if you could just touch on that, like the, the structure of the, the two tokens that you have in your, your economy, um, I think that would be super helpful. Sure. Um, I mean, on the first two, just to address, uh, you know, and I uh, appreciate your comments on it, uh, our number one priority is making sure that we have an entertaining and engaging gameplay experience, period. Right, like that. That's how you'll attract users. That's why people will want to join is because it's fun. Um, I, I think... Um, as much as I see the potential and value in play to earn in unlocking a global digital economy, um, ultimately the catalyst for that growth and user adoption is going to start with making sure that we have a fun product that people want to engage with. Um, right. So that's our focus um, in terms of will it last generations. I've kind of outlined how we actually intend for this to be a new digital society that can last forever, that people can build upon forever um, and have built financial infrastructure around that exact objective. Um, the third one, uh, was the, um, accessibility, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of accessibility, it's, it's, uh, there's so many components to this. This could be an extended conversation in and of itself, but let me just start by again, outlining there's, there's a reason why we're building across multiple platforms. Um, Unreal Engine is one, uh, this is, this targets are, you know, 
you could consider it a niche audience, but it's also a global gaming community that's probably a couple hundred million large um, at minimum. But yes, the requirements are uh, a bit more intensive in terms of computing hardware that you need to be able to access and play this game and appreciate the full visual fidelity that's available here. Um, so I, I'm just speaking of how many people can access based on technology. So there's Unreal Engine, there's the web client, that's going to expose a lot more people to this to a version of this product. And then the third is mobile. This is essentially globally accessible at this point via smartphone. Um, now, the, the companion app that we have in development isn't necessarily the same as playing Star Atlas, but it is participation in the Star Atlas economy with some other unique mechanics behind it. Uh, what I think is really exciting in terms of future tech is pixel streaming. And so there's uh, Render is a project being built on Solana, but also Stadia, um, which I think they just Microsoft just shut down actually. But Stadia pixel streaming is essentially remote or in the cloud rendering, GPU rendering, and content mm -hmm. streaming that to a mobile device. So you can essentially get the full game fidelity that you would get if you were playing on your computer, but delivered directly to your mobile phone. It's all still early stage stuff. It's not, you know, it's not in the, the best place just yet, but it's still um, in development. So, and I think that's going to enhance accessibility in the future. Now, the other side is uh, financial accessibility. One is platform or technology, the other is financial accessibility. We've structured the game from day one to accommodate a, an incredibly wide range of audience. So assets that start as low as $15. And yes, we've sold assets over $100,000 for a single ship. Um, there's a scaling system that's in place and a progression system in, that's in place that um, kind of, uh, I won't say prohibits, but uh, limits this idea of pay to win. Right? Like you still have to actually progress through the game to be able to access some of those higher tier items or those mo more expensive items. And the operating requirements are substantially higher on those as well. But from a pure dollar perspective, you essentially can get in, you can, uh, and then you can earn your way through bigger and better items as time progresses. And then we're also putting significant thought into how do we enable some free to play features that allows people to at least get exposure, start playing, enjoy themselves, and actually earn a place for themselves in this world as well. So this is a big category. We are uh, we are focused on ensuring that accessibility is broad. You want me to pause there or move into tokenomics? Uh, I do have a do have a question. Um, so for in terms of there's a third department of accessibility, I think. It's the amount of time that you have to spend playing the game, right? Like on a weekly basis. So like if you're me and you work for Alex Chiswick and you work a hundred back breaking hours a week, will I have time to actually succeed in this game? Will it be worthwhile for me or, or should I not bother playing? Your job is to play Star Atlas until <laughs> your fingers are bleeding. Like until there's blood coming through, you know, from... From all the all the crypto that you're earning, all the Atlas and Polis, all the Atlas you're earning, converting to Polis, and governing the game. You've heard it here first. Alex. It's live. It's recorded. Uh, you have new roles and responsibilities in your job description. <laughs> That's I'm gonna update LinkedIn during this uh, during this recording. Too. Chief finger bleeding <laughs> officer. It's <laughs> a great title. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, it's at the end of the day, again, it's it's really more about having fun. Uh, yes, there's a play to earn component. There's an earnings component. Uh, it's, um, I would say like any game though, especially the more complex, sophisticated games, the more you play, the better you're going to be from a skill perspective and the, the further along your character is going to be. Um, now, you don't necessarily need to be competitive with every single other player. There's different modals of participating too, and there's pure... Uh, player versus environment experiences that you'll be able to engage in and missions and and um, like bounties and stuff that you can do and just have a good time. Now, in many ways, you are kind of competing with every other user through the economic lens. So, you know, let's say your earnings potential is going to be limited by the amount of time that you have available for the game. But I think that's natural, right? Like the more time you spend in the game, the greater your, your earnings potential should be. That's scalable. Um, I think that's the dynamic of reality, too more time you spend working well maybe not i don't know you know you could probably you may probably make the same if you work 40 hours versus 100 hours but we know you love what you do harrison so 
can't put a price on that. (laughs) Yeah, you can't. You definitely can't. Yeah. Um, So, uh, yeah, I mean, I I think like at the end of the day. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you you answered that question. I was half joking. um, See, uh, half joking. So 50 hours a week, he's going to play Star (laughs) Atlas. I think it'll be so much fun. You'll you'll want to you'll find as much time as you can to play. I'm I'm personally super looking forward to it. Um, I'm actually kind I, of scared, Michael. If, if I'm honest with you, like I I don't really want to try to play because I think <laughs> I might get addicted. I'm ready actually, to go all in on this one. Like I, the full six degree of freedom motion simulator. Uh, I already have the VR headset and PC that's capable of of playing. But I want to get. Have you, have you guys ever uh, seen those? full motion sims i've never been in one has is it pretty cool well i haven't uh i haven't been in a, a consumer version of one only in a like a commercial version of, uh, of one but uh, it looks incredible <laughs> so <laughs> well here's actually he, here's an interesting uh here's an interesting question all jokes aside so look we, we've seen with axie right in the bull market most popular game literally just were being torn apart by the media in, in a good way. Like I, everyone wanted to play Axie. The bear market comes, and I forgot the stats, but there there were pretty you know atrocious stats of players. It's like ninety nine percent of the gameplay is gone. Mm-hmm. You're building yours for the long term. We will have another bull run. We will have another bear market. You know um, how do you in the in the the Axie example is actually pretty interesting to me because typically uh, gaming is a is a little it, it's like it's like economy agnostic, right? You want right. a game when you're having when when things are good, and sometimes when things are shit. Excuse me, family fr- family friendly uh, um, uh, audience. When things are not so good, um, people still want a game to get their mind off of the poop that I mentioned earlier. So yeah. how do you ensure that your volumes aren't going to fall, right? In, in terms of gamers, have you have you guys thought about this, especially now in the, in the current market environment? Well, yes. I mean, our user base should be agnostic to the broad macroeconomic trends that are occurring uh, globally, but also, you know, specifically within crypto markets, um, simply because, uh, you know, I think the reality was, I, I think, Axie is great. These guys were pioneers, right? And they kind of, they created this category of play to earn, but I think that was also their primary attraction. So this is what we were just discussing is like, is the game fun um, or is are, are people financially motivated to participate in the ecosystem? And there was a significant audience that was financially motivated. And so when you remove that financial factor because crypto markets are down, so now your earnings are down. So now it's no longer that, valuable for you to be actually spending your time in this world, um, then yes, your audience is going to be as volatile as crypto markets. The, um, uh, again, not a criticism of Axie, but is their game fun? I think a lot of people, uh, you know, at least in the stages of 2021, uh, people weren't having a great time playing the game, right? So gaming in general should be resilient to financial market cycles, assuming that there's a reason that people want to be there. And that primary reason is just enjoying themselves. We play video games. uh, We play video games for a sense of escapism. We want to get out of reality. We don't want to focus on reality. And so, again, that's that's why, you know, we are focused heavily on the experience, the immersiveness that brings you into a distant world. the other, uh, the other aspect to this, though, is maybe counterintuitively, or maybe it's intuitive, but uh, games tend to perform better in down market cycles, if that makes sense. Uh, and I'll explain. Uh, like, Axie actually blew up during the pandemic when uh, everybody was under quarantine, uh, and a lot of people were unemployed. So what often happens is when you see the economy enter recession or potentially depression, people are losing jobs, they're spending more time at home, they have less disposable income. Well, how do they entertain themselves? They, they watch Netflix. Uh, they're not going out, they're not going to bars. 
uh, they're not spending because they don't have the disposable income. And so they're, they're playing video games. They're watching Netflix. They're spending more time at home. Maybe they're going out and camping or hiking. Um, and so, you know, who knows? I'm not going to speculate on what's going to happen with the economy here, but, but from a macro lens, things aren't looking great. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of headwinds in front of the economy right now. And, and so, um, I actually think it could be quite favorable for an audience that would be interested in playing Star Atlas, not only because it's fun, but then we add that that little touch, that nice little incentive of, hey, there's actually financial implications to playing as well. So this this might be an opportunity for people who otherwise don't have the opportunity or are otherwise unemployed. So it's what's really important here the, is distinguishing between the emphasis between those two elements. Yeah, I, I know um, I've been monopolizing just one more and I'll turn over to Harrison. It's interesting how you distinguish between the fun and the uh, earning part of it. Hopefully, you know, with you guys and, and in general, the industry goes into, you know, both fun and the ability to uh, to actually earn. Let's go back in terms of, I, I just wanted to have one question that we didn't talk about in terms of, uh, you know, game playing and what you guys are building. Um when do you feel like in the me medium to long term when are you, when are you, are you going to feel like you know what we're kind of done pencils down for what we wanted to develop right and then maybe it's not our pencils down you're always going to be iterating but there's going to be some sort of the original crew that came together you and so on that you guys have built like if you know Microsoft probably finally built Windows, Windows first came out, it's out there, then you're perfecting it. And then the second part to this is in, in your vision, five, 10 years from now, at some point, I'm sure you're going to want to retire and um, and planet whatever <laughs> in the Star Atlas uh, metaverse. But when you are thinking about the legacy, who's going to maintain the game? You know, will it be a community driven maintenance? Will it be uh, still a core group of developers? Have you thought about that? I know it's a while from now and we're all focused on building, but call it year 10, year 15, when this thing is really uh, has a mind of its own, if you will, who's going to maintain the system? Yeah, well, we think about it extensively and it's, uh, it's going to be impossible for me to provide an accurate projection of what that future looks like in 10 to 15 years, just simply because there's so many dynamic elements to the way that we're building. Uh, ultimate objective is to get to a state of full decentralization. Um, now, you know, what happens with technology between now and then is, is something that I'm, you know, that's the implication is I have no way of actually predicting that, but, um, uh, you know, let's, let's imagine we enter into a place where the blockchain is actually capable of managing all different levels of uh, compute transactions on chain. And we can move away from the any level of centralized storage of data, centralized processing, you know, game server hosting, and we can essentially host the entire game on Solana. And then individuals are able to operate their own nodes uh, participating in the network and uh, we, we enter this true state of censorship resistant decentralization. That's where we'd like to go. Now, to the extent that that's not viable, then then we would continue to maintain the game servers. I mean, I, I imagine this thing to be a pretty phenomenal success, and, and it already has been. But, um, you know, of course, either we would be or we would identify infrastructure that allows for the continuity of the, of the product itself. So, um, uh, but there's there's kind of the ideal vision of how this thing functions in the future and it's it is all governed by the way by this decentralized autonomous organization by this dao uh, which we're already in the process of transitioning things like intellectual property rights over to and uh, transferring revenue streams into as opposed to having all of the value captured by us as a company and as a studio and as a developer <clears throat> sharing in the value exchange between the dao um, and and us as a company to ensure that we can bring this product to fruition. So uh, a lot of the governance structure of this is, I, I would say, more predictable than how does the technology transform over time. Yeah, and the, I mean, the way that you set up governance is super, I've never seen anything like it in crypto. Um, uh, I mean, you can, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about it, but like, it's three tiered, right? So there's the star atlas DAO that governs the entire ecosystem 
Um, and then there's faction DAOs, right? So each of the three factions, they can, it's like a, uh, a government basically, right? Like a parliament. And then below that is regional DAOs, right? That's right. Um, so the way you guys have thought, I mean, you, you've thought this out for futures to come, maybe, maybe not as good as the founding fathers did, but uh, some are saying it, it could be as good, almost as good. I'm offended. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we're pioneers. No. <laughs> you know, what's, what's funny about this, though, is um, we think about the, the founding fathers and we think about the, say, the inception of the United States. And um, I've in at times described Star Atlas as kind of a new America moment. It's a new opportunity. And you know, we have this kind of running, I, I, I guess, unofficial motto of power to the people. It's this is a, a an opportunity for people to create something for themselves. And, you know, we're not I'm not proposing a ubiquitously fair system for everyone. It's still competitive, but at least the opportunity is present for everyone to participate in. And that's, you know, ultimately where we're trying to go with this. But, you know, America also was informed in over the course of one year or I, 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 my American history fails me at this, at this age, but <laughs> you know, it took, it took time as the point, right. And a lot of deliberation and many brilliant minds uh, collectively discussing what an optimal structure would be. And it was through that process that they were able to come to, you know, what we have is modern day uh, government. So what we're doing, the steps that we're taking today, though, across Star Atlas is actually the introduction of a lot of the same floor for debate. Um, we just released a sustainable governance framework and document uh, that came out on September 29th as well. Quite a few releases came out on the, the 29th event. Um, so there's a whole white paper that describes what we anticipate to be a sustainable framework for decentralization over time. But on the backside of that is... Um, introducing a few uh, structural changes, well, structural elements to the DAO, I would say. One is the formation of a constitution, which takes into account feedback and, and uh, discourse from the community at large. So we're working with the community to form a constitution for Star Atlas. There's also uh, a council system, um, which is um, kind of a, I wouldn't call it a, a, a delegate system, but the council system is intended to curate proposals as they get introduced to the DAO. So the the the, the uh, technological process here is, is generally um, somebody submits a proposal for something they'd like to see happen. And this could be virtually anything, any change that they would like to see. Um, uh, that proposal then gets uh, approved to be voted upon, and the council will participate at that level. They'll review all of these proposals that come in. They'll screen for anything that is maybe illegal or unethical or just doesn't make sense. Um, the things that get approved by this council system then pass on to the um, uh, uh, the electorate, the the voters, and then voting is determined by polis voting power, PVP, and your PVP is a function. It's really based on the curve model of voting, but it's essentially a multiplier model based on the amount of polis that you lock up in this contract over the amount of time that you've committed to anywhere from two weeks all the way up to five years. I want to, I want to, I want to, um, you know, tangent here very quickly and just comment that our community base of 220,000 people has extremely high conviction in our ecosystem. Uh, something like 30 uh, to 35 percent of the total circulating supply of the token is currently locked up in in this uh, polis locker. Of that, about 80 percent of the total <laughs> locked amount is locked at five years, the maximum duration. And there is no slashing fee that somebody can pay to get access to their tokens. Again, these are just locked for the next five years, no, not recoverable until the end of that period. So most of our community understands that, um, you know, this is a long-term project with a very long-term vision and they wanna be participants in that governance um, system uh, for the duration of it. So um, anyway, moving back, the, the polis voting power is kind of your weight across the ecosystem. It gets voted upon, it gets approved or, de or denied. Uh, and then it moves to, you know, the kind of the legal framework, which is the, there's the DAO and then there's the Star Atlas Foundation, which effectuates any of the change uh, or enters into any contractual relationship as necessary on behalf of the DAO, given that the DAO is a non-jurisdictional and registered entity. So uh, that was probably a lot, um, a lot to digest there, but 
to your point, that's just the Panaculum DAO. That's that's the top level DAO that governs the ecosystem. Within the game itself, there's the faction, uh, regional, and then you could even uh, argue that our guild system itself is effectively a component of the DAO system, because each of the guilds then has their own members that they um, that they collectively govern and we're building tools specifically for guild management and governance structures so that they can manage their own uh, kind of micro community within the broader star atlas gotcha yeah and and like i said before i i've never seen anything like it at least in crypto so um thanks should be should be awesome uh, but Mike, i wanna can ask can I ask a quick 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 question 30 second how did no. you guys come up with the tokenomics it's very complex but it's very thought through was it internal did you guys you just because just, you guys have done a really good job here yeah i would say largely internal but we've worked with some some great groups um through tokenomic structuring like the governance and let's just distinguish between say like the governance functionality and also the broader tokenomics um specifically on tokenomics a lot of that was driven by us but we worked with republic crypto um over the course uh over several months during 2021 to help kind of refine and finalize everything there a lot of the governance structure um, the, the vast majority came directly from our team and a uh, big credit to our in-house general counsel dan park who's who's kind of been leading the effort on that okay harrison all you uh, that, that actually was my question i was just gonna say i wasn't gonna let you get away without uh without hitting that fourth pillar of good games in crypto my question was more aggressive. Alex was very nice about it, but I mean, there's just certain structures that have been set up. I, they're not Ponzi's, but like they require more people to join the game for the token to continue rising in price. Um, at least I'm yeah. referring to like Axie Infinity or like some of the other games that have had the, the dual currency systems. Um, so I'm just curious, like, and I'm, I'm sure listeners are curious how Star Atlas set themselves up differently. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say any of it is uh, Ponzi-nomics, I think, as it's uh, colloquially referred to at this point. But, um, yeah. you know, generally, okay, so let's um, let's go back and separate. Polis is utilized for all of this governance structure, and I've just kind of outlined how the governance yeah. structure works and how you're a participant in that ecosystem. You know, some of the benefits, I, I guess I should just mention quickly, of being um, a Polis stakeholder includes not only participating in changes to the ecosystem as well as the gameplay mechanics, but also things like treasury management. Now, this one is, um, I, I think, probably not fully understood by the world at large, what the how powerful the impact of this can be. Um, and maybe let me just give you an example. We are still very early in development, as we've commented extensively on throughout this conversation. Uh, already, the, the, the DAO has collected some 300 million Atlas or so in the form of revenue um, that's sitting in, in an isolated treasury ready to be utilized for the further development and growth of the ecosystem. Now, 300 million Atlas, there's there's 36 billion that will be uh, released over time. It's released over an eight year schedule. There's about, uh, I wanna say about 30% of the token supply is currently in circulation. So there's another 70% that still needs to be issued over the next seven years um, in and around, um, don't quote me exactly on those numbers, but it's very close. Um, now, of the you know, so of the thirty percent, ten billion or so that's in circulation, again, three hundred million has already been collected over the course of one year through one specific game function that exists, which is Faction Fleet. Now, um, uh, I guess without getting into the specific value of that uh, uh, of that treasury balance, like what any pull of stakeholder will get to determine how to use that, and that could be uh, the way that I envision it being used is uh, say running hackathons, running game jams, running events where we encourage, motivate, and incentivize further development around Star Atlas. This this tangibility, this like growth uh, of our ecosystem through, uh, through a grant system. We can actually use the DAO to pay developers to build new features, new products, new expansions. In so many ways, the way that Star Atlas operates is synonymous to the way that a layer one protocol 
cultivates itself and grows. We build primitives, we build tools, we build infrastructure, and we are genuinely in an ecosystem and we can facilitate the growth and development of products all around Star Atlas. And we're already seeing this happen. And not only do can people be enticed to build because the users exist there, but they can be enticed to build because there's an entire financial mechanism in place that can incentivize them to do so. That's just one example. There's many, many different ways that the treasury asset, assets can be spent. But the entire economy of Star Atlas, this entire universe that's in development, uh, is uh, from day one intrinsically has had a method of capturing some of the value off of the GDP that's produced there and funneling that directly into the DAO, which means we have a perpetual mechanism that allows for the growth and development of the ecosystem with or without automata in place. So that's the DAO. <clears throat> um, Atlas is, is in-game transactional currency. It's required for every single thing that you do inside the game. As you operate your ship, you have to purchase things like food and fuel and ammunition and toolkits. That's what you need to purchase today to participate in Faction Fleet. Uh, you've, you purchase those with Atlas. Um, th that, by the way, is the pretty much the exclusive method that has driven all of this 300 million Atlas into the DAO is every time somebody buys that, that money doesn't come to us as a studio. That money, that Atlas that people spend goes directly to the DAO. Mm -hmm. um, the second feature we just introduced on the 29th was uh, we do have marketplace fees now that we've introduced. It's a 6% fee on secondary transactions. Excuse me, it's only on the selling side, but 33% um, of uh, of all of those marketplace transactions also go directly to the DAO. So it's, a, it's kind of a rev share with the DAO itself. So <clears throat> in order to operate within this world, you need Atlas. Um, it's, how, it's what you pay other players in. It's the denomination that you earn in. Um, it's how you maintain operations of anything that you're doing uh, within the world itself. Now, um, we think extensively about token syncs throughout the game. And also creating uh, kind of psychological mechanisms that encourage people to retain uh, retain earnings, right? Like the I what what I try to stress and emphasize is um, is creating a, a, a reality in this simulation that uh, models kind of our real world experience, which is to say, you know, the hundred hours a month or, or rather hundred hours a week that you work, you're getting paid us dollars, right? Um, now you're probably not spending all of that. Uh, some of it's going in your bank account at no point in your thinking. Are you like, Oh man, I need to take this, my paycheck and convert it into Euro or convert it into pound or Chinese yuan, right? Like you're, you're not thinking I need to convert my earnings into some other currency. So why should people inside Star Atlas have the mentality that they need to take their Atlas earnings and convert that into some other currency, whether that be domestic or otherwise? Let's create utility, let's create value, let's create functionality and token sinks in the game that actually inspire people to think of their earnings in this digital society um, as one and the same as their earnings in the real world. And you know, this is this could take many, many years, right? We're still looking for Bitcoin payment adoption globally, but there's the potential that people accept Atlas at some point in the future. In fact, uh, in the Philippines, which is where Axie was kind of most successful, arguably, um, businesses were accepting Axies, right? Um, I, I think that was their currency unit. I, AXS, I think, is their currency unit. Uh, so kind of in much the same way, we're trying to stimulate and, and simulate an economy that, that functions very much like the real world. And there's inputs and outputs and there's some winners and there's some losers and the last part um, that i'll mention here which i think is really critical is that ultimately there are going to be consumers of products and there are going to be producers of products um, this is I, I don't want to imply it's a zero sum game but trust me when i say that there will be many millions of players that will be interested in engaging in star atlas and don't care whatsoever about being able to extract value out of the game they're more than happy to spend a few dollars or tens of dollars or a hundred dollars a month to participate in a gaming experience that is superior for them and that's a convenience for them um, because the game is fun. So you have people that are willing to put a hundred dollars into the game. That doesn't all come to us. Once again, as the studio, it actually gets transferred to the players in the game who are willing to produce the goods that improve the experience for the other player. So it's not all about the emission curve. It's not all about inflation. It's about creating a sustainable um, uh, and, and functional long-term economy in this universe. Yeah. 
And if you're, I mean, if the game is as fun as uh, you're expecting it to be, then people shouldn't, they won't be spending much money on other games or gaming systems. They'll be, you know, predominantly focused on this one. So they'll have more budget to spend on it. Yeah. Well, look, guys, I think, I think we're going to have to start coming up to, uh, we can, we can have you on again. We should, we have to start coming up to an end. We usually end with a thing called, okay, or not okay. Like pineapples or pizza. I say, okay. Some people say not okay. You know, we'll ask you these kind of questions. Sure. It's a hot seat route. Okay. Are you ready? Not okay. <laughs> not okay. Oh, we lost pineapples him. and pizza. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> That's not okay. Um, oh, that's not yeah, okay. I can, I can ask. We have a couple listed out here. Uh, pineapples on pizza. You say not okay to that. Oh, no, I was saying not okay to Alex, and that's the power that I possess here. Oh, you saw how quickly he got cut I off got the screen. I got defensive. I got scared. Okay. I am well, totally okay with pineapples on pizza. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm reserving one. Wait, what wait, are your wait, thoughts wait, wait, wait. on using your followers as exit liquidity? Definitely not okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, that, was, that was an easy one. What about uh, OKCoin's okay conference parties? Those are okay. I've been to a few. Okay, good for the people. Uh, for the people that are listening here, Michael loves our parties. He's he's underemphasizing how much he enjoys them. Uh, they're so much <laughs> they're, fun. They're more than okay. They're fantastic. <laughs> but I thought my options were okay or not okay. So I'm just trying to conform here. But uh, no, you guys you guys throw some great events. No, that's true. That's true. Um, thank you for that. And then uh, I would Alex might have some of his own, but he's he still yeah. Can he? What about looking at crypto prices every day? How do you feel about that? Uh, I, I would largely say not okay. It's not, um, you know, you're probably not going to make any decisions, or at least you shouldn't really be making any decisions based on these short-term timelines and timeframes. Um, you know, it's it's probably unhealthy for people psychologically, particularly in markets like we're in right now. Um, but but. Uh, generally also to be uh, also said to be true in, in bull markets. So I guess I'm going to say not okay on this one. Although, um, look, I'm guilty of it, especially I, you guys know I've been in the space for about 10 years. So, you know, there was a there was certainly a time in, in my uh, history here where it I was checking the phone every single day. In fact, 100 times a day looking at prices. So I get it. I get why everyone's doing it. But, um, you know, I think it's it's probably more mentally healthy not to be so hyper focused on the short term. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to not look at prices when we're in a bear market, frankly. But um, I think that's everything for me. Alex is gone. Uh, is there anything you want to wrap with, Michael, anywhere people should should look for you or for Star Atlas to learn more about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so first and foremost, if you haven't ever been on our website, staratlas.com, I encourage everybody to kind of take a peek through that. It's a multi-time award-winning website that is immersive and pulls you into the metaverse. It, it accomplishes it, its goal there. But um, the next logical step is to join us in Discord, discord.gg slash staratlas. Uh, we have a phenomenal community there, an incredibly helpful community leadership team, uh, a lot of community mods, uh, a lot of support and help documentation and tutorials. So um, it's, it's definitely probably the fastest way to get up to speed on all the things that we're doing. Um, you know, you can Follow us on Twitter at Star Atlas. Uh, mine's a little bit weird. It's it's at and then spelled out A T underscore M Wagner, but uh, I'm sure you can find me on there. And uh, I would also maybe just close and say, for anyone that is um, really interested about the most recent product releases, uh, this was we call this the 426 Live event. Uh, it was on September 29th. It was streamed live through Twitch. Uh, I would encourage you to go watch the recording on YouTube and, and uh, you'll get uh, caught up on, on the six major releases that came out just on September 29th. So a lot more to come from us. Uh, we do have an exciting end of the year still lined up. So look forward to seeing some more of you uh, join us in Star Atlas. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and we'll have that link uh, to the recording on the YouTube post. So for those looking for it, it should be right below your screen. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It was great having you on. 
Thanks, Alex, who's no longer here. I'm Alex here, is, I'm is here. secretly uh, in chat, but we, we don't see him anymore. So, <laughs> all right, Alex, uh, it was a pleasure, Harrison. Thanks, man. Really appreciate the time. Always enjoy chatting with you guys. Yeah, you too. I, uh, I'll take this notice uh, to not mess with you, given what you did to Alex today. <laughs>